Hello. Uh, we had a problem. I sent to everyone an email. I hope they saw it, which when I realized that I was going to have to get tech services to help figure out why I couldn't log on like I always have on to Zoom with the same exact steps and procedures as I've used for two years. And they don't know why. <laughs> Uh, but I did figure it out by just going through three or four different uh, experimental steps. So I don't know why that's happening. Maybe Zoom is doing some kind of a blocking thing because they've had hacking. I have no idea. But what concerns me is, let me ask you, I know we only have like two or three people here at the moment. Those who are here, did you guys see the email I sent at about 2.54 just saying, give me till 10 after. And I hope some of the other students saw that because I'm going to presume the, the class, I mean, we're going to, you know, proceed. I meant to say proceed with the class. Um, yeah, so I saw the email, but I think the reason why, uh, pretty sure I'm the only one here, um, is because in your uh, Zoom meeting info email where you sent the code, uh, I think it's off by a number. Um, uh -oh. It says 2-1 at the end, right? Yeah, and let me double check because... <laughs> Oh, I was so flustered because I couldn't get anybody live to tell me what was going on and they still don't know what's going on. So, so oh, I have the Zoom yeah. number written down and I thought I entered it correctly. I'm going to re-enter it then. Let me do that. Thank you. That's helpful for you to point that out. Let me, yeah, no problem. Interesting. It shouldn't have two one. It should only have the one. So the two right before it uh, oh, should be there. Okay. Yeah. Say that last thing again. Thank you. One more time. Uh, it says 621 at the end of the uh, meeting right. number, and, and it should just be 61. Oh, yeah, there we go. That should make it feasible, too. Okay. There we go. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, but what I can't find is the original note I had, so now I don't have it memorized. Oh, there it is. I got it. It's tucked away under six pieces of uh, class handouts. There we go. Oh, wow. This whole thing threw me for a loop. I've never seen it do that before, but that would explain. So it's 983. I know I wrote it down carefully because slowly, I always do this since the first time I did Zoom classes, I had to make sure a couple times I sent the wrong number. So apparently that's what happened. Now, sorry, you're still with us? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm here. Okay, 0261 is what I have written down. So I must have put an extra two in there. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Uh, the one. Yeah, that would make sense. So my state of mind had not exactly been <laughs> focused as much as it usually is. So hopefully that'll help more people get in. But that's, uh, I must say, I, I would say the word impressed that you were able to figure out what the discrepancy was and help your fellow students, well, all of us, me included, <laughs> to avoid yeah. having oh, canceled you. meeting. I was going to go ahead and just lecture and record it, but that's not what we're here for. I'm supposed, I don't like doing it asynchronous classes or I would have asked for them. There we go. So let me now just let these other people in as they hopefully slowly start to sign in. Who knows how many we'll get, but at least it'll be more than two. <laughs> All right, so let me do a couple of announcements because uh, what we're having now is a, uh, a kind of personally, I guess you could say, individual selection of slides that you don't have to take notes on for the first 20 minutes. And they're gonna be my slides of Egypt. So you don't have to take notes or even think about being studied. We already covered ancient Egypt. So then we'll segue into this week's main topic, which is of course, uh, art of the Aegean and ancient uh, Greece. Uh, but we'll get to that, um, probably we'll get started. We'll get started on those slides. Um, Aegean art, sorry, I meant just Aegean art this week. Also, so we have two weeks from uh, Wednesday, no, one, one week, sorry, let me re uh, rephrase that. One week from Wednesday, that would be the 23rd, is your first papers due. So let, while I'm waiting to get let more people in, thank heaven, 
working our way up to a quorum here. Okay, any questions about your papers? I pretty much answered everything I think I, I could think of about what the requirements are, and I sent everybody the five requirements for your short papers, plus a sample. But if anybody didn't get that, of course, you can ask for those uh, to be sent individually uh, if you'll contact me through the Mark W at AOL, because there's some, again, cumbersome multi-step process, to, at least when I log on to Outlook off campus that makes it much more time consuming and complicated to send individual students any handouts as PDFs. So my point being that if you want me to follow any time this semester with something you're missing or lost or miss, you know, deleted or whatever, you can do that. But please ask me on my Mark W at AOL if you want it more quickly. And so if anyone, in other words, once again, if you're just joining us, if anybody's missing uh, or didn't get or somehow can't find, their handouts on how to, you know, five requirements for your, your short papers, right? That's the first one. And the other is a sample paper to show you what an A paper looks like. Because by now you should be working on your papers or at least be doing the research and have an idea of what, uh, you know, you're going to say. Uh, because the papers are due nine days from today. And that's uh, before midnight. So you have some extra time after the class meets a week from Wednesday, the 23rd. It's on your syllabus, of course. Okay, so hopefully we have enough students that uh, what I'm going to do is now, like I said, but, but first, any questions again about the papers? Um, yeah, last class you said it was due um, March 7th. No, that was for the other class. It's on your syllabus. Yeah, I understand. That's why I'm doing this now. No, it's you're right to bring that up. Because, oh, yeah, that's what you, you said last time. Though. Okay. Yeah. Right. Well, here it is on the syllabus. And I need to stick to what's on the syllabus. That's actually required. The college requires that, of course, unless there's some kind of like, you know, natural disaster or health issue that affects my teaching uh, or accepting work from people on that day. So, because then I've got a staggered schedule. You can imagine I've got three different subjects with three different due dates. They can't, if everything came in at once, I wouldn't be able to get to the grading in a timely fashion and get them back to you guys in a timely fashion. So since this class, uh, you know, is rather uh, smaller than most or my both, I should say both my other two classes, I can get these graded more quickly and get them back Hi, to you. Um, I was just calling to see if I could get an appointment. <laughs> sure. Are you a patient of records? Sounds like um, No, I'm not. My father is, though. Okay. Okay, so. Um, uh, you, you uh, someone doesn't yes. know their microphone's okay, on and they're on the phone. Oh, he's fine. Are you under his insurance? Yes, sure. yeah. Uh, his name is Roger okay. Shimoye. Yeah. Hello. R O G E R. That realizing they are. C A C H E V A L I E R. Is it Serena? Maybe I should do that. Maybe that's it. No, that didn't work. I think it's work. Haley. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. I think it's Haley. And then uh, what is your question? Uh, Haley. H. There we go. Right. So hopefully they will unmute themselves if they have a question. Okay. Thank you. That that was helpful. Uh, I apologize, you guys, for the delay, but it had nothing to do with anything I did or didn't do. I, I got ready even a few minutes earlier than usual, and then I was blocked from getting onto my Zoom account because it was asking for a new password that no one had ever asked for before in two years of teaching Zoom classes since the pandemic began. And uh, so I had to call tech services. And then as I was on the phone with them, I even before they explained what was wrong, I guessed that there must be a different password. So luckily, my very efficient wife has uh, thought of these things when she helped me set this account up, the two of us together back in spring 2020. And she wrote on a piece of tape that I didn't even see on the side of my laptop, uh, Zoom password. I, I didn't know, I th you use your own password from the college or the SRJC email password. That's all I was ever told to use. So apparently there's you know a set extra step they've now started requiring and he didn't used to. I stored that password the, 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 the first time I used Zoom and I thought that's it. It never bothered or asked me for that. So that was what the delay was and you guys were very patient. And then the other problem is on me. I was one digit off on, I forget if it was the first or second time I sent the, the uh, Zoom login number. So that's why you got a second sending, resending. Thank you for your patience. I really appreciate it. And it'll be worth your time. So let's go ahead and get, unless there is a, here we go, middle, good, good time. Okay, is there anybody who has an urgent question? Because I did just confirm with one of your fellow students that what's on the syllabus, that's what we have to stick to at you know all the colleges I've ever taught at, and certainly at this one, uh, the due dates, in other words. 
Uh, this is your paper is going to be on the 23rd. That's uh, nine days from now. So you still have some time. And of course, you could still email me a sample of your paper, as I've said to all classes and all the students in every class every semester that if you want me to look it over and tell you if you're missing anything, as long as you don't wait till the night before it's due, at least 48 hours before it's due. Okay, so you see there at the bottom of the page we're on now, because here we are on uh, week five, first paper due uh, mid by midnight. So I'm giving you a little extra time there too. Usually it's due in class, but we're, you know, virtual obviously. So you have until midnight, it wouldn't be counted late on uh, Wednesday, a week from Wednesday, February 23rd. So you've got more than nine days, technically nine and almost nine and a half, but you should be starting to, to, to write the papers or at least to pick the topic and be researching it by now. So any other urgent questions from anybody about, uh, I think I pretty much answered that. Let's get to the slides. Okay, so uh, the first few, these are ones just for your own uh, um, in, enlightenment, however you wanna call that, uh, which would mean in other words, that this is not tested material, uh, material that is not gonna be on the test. The first 15 or 20 minutes, we're just gonna take a trip to Egypt as I did when I was um, still in graduate school myself, in fact, yeah, with two other teachers, in fact, from Skyline High School in Oakland while I was working on my master's. These are from, yes, you're gonna say, wow, they're so old, why are we looking at them? Not that much has changed in, in uh, much of the, uh, world uh, the 80s these are from the 80s i'll go ahead and tell you that up front the cars might look different okay this is from a hotel balcony looking down 10 floors to the street level on the morning after we arrived and i was trying to figure out what these people were doing they were avoiding a an open sewer that had collapsed here and that's an unfortunate side effect of this city being overwhelmed with human bodies coming in from all over egypt and even other countries cairo went from being about eight million when I was in college, I remember thinking, oh, that's the same as New York City within the city limits is New York is now almost 9 million. Uh, and now it's 18 million. It's more than doubled in just the last 40 years, the population. And of course that puts a strain on the infrastructure, but <clears throat> parts of the city look like they did when the British, you know, this was a colony. Some of you know that uh, Egypt was under British rule for well over a hundred years. And uh, these are some of the buildings that were built during that colonial period, which they still use for their government. This is their parliament building. Of course, it's a dictatorship. I think everyone knows that. They're, they're, there's just window dressing in terms of any kind of democracy there. But uh, they did briefly have one for a while in the uh, right mid aughts, I think it was before the, that one elected ruler was uh, the president rather, was overthrown <clears throat> by the military. So the people are some of the nicest people I have ever met, the friendliest, most uh, helpful. Um, I, I really enjoyed the experience of getting to meet Egyptian citizens. So you'll see evidence of that. Now here you see on the rooftop, let's move over here. You see all the mosques and minarets on the mosque, of course. Uh, some of the buildings we'll see in another slide that's the next one after this, that a lot of these buildings have started, uh, and this is a while ago, so they're probably worse now, started to crumbling is what I call them, junk pile um, effect is there, there. This is the oldest mosque in Egypt. It was from 700 AD, which is within the lifetime of, uh, I believe it's uh, Muhammad's either son or probably grandson who, who had it uh, built when Cairo was a, a new city. Cairo is not an ancient city, it's a medieval city. It didn't exist, of course, in ancient Egypt. Um, <clears throat> Memphis was the capital for a lot, large part of the ancient Egyptian kingdoms. But anyway, the point is that this is right at the uh, top of a, of a hill, at the foot of which is the city of the dead. And when they say that, I thought I understood, oh, oh I mean, it's just a cemetery, right? Well, yes and no, it's not just a cemetery. What happens is these people arriving from the countryside have nowhere, many of them, nowhere to live. 5,000 people a day was what they told. I bet it's twice that now. Every day arriving without any place, to, no job, right? And maybe they don't know anybody in the city or they have relatives who are already overwhelmed with previous in-laws who showed up unannounced. So they can't help them. So they have nowhere to live. And some of them take over these um, tombs in cemeteries, like the one where my cursor is pointed. Uh, right here in that area between this mosque and this one. 
it's a large uh, medieval cemetery. So I, it's a little, I don't know, bizarre, but it's literally what we saw. I was with my two teacher friends. <clears throat> and for some reason, I, we decided we shouldn't take photos of this. There were families living inside the tombs and there were skeletons and even somewhat decomposed bodies lying on the ground or with kids running around playing and, and parents making food. <laughs> Yeah, you know, they had nowhere else to live, so they took over the tombs of some of these hundreds and hundreds of years old uh, grave sites. And that's why they called the City of the Dead. And then you see the junk pile effect I was talking about. Here you have a somewhat maintained, semi maintained sidewalk, and then the street is just not at all. But then you've got a far mini farmer's market here where some of the farmers come into town just to, you know, sell what they have to their, um, you know, possible. <clears throat> clients or maybe even decide that they want to try and find a place to, to live in the city if they can't make a living at, at farming. This is the Egyptian air office. And here is an example of what we saw a lot of in Cairo. Uh, it's a very nice building and it's still pretty, you know, reasonable. Well, we're missing a few <laughs> places here and there, but this is when they were gonna paint it, they were going to paint the whole building. And we asked the guy running the front desk when we bought tickets to fly down to Luxor which you'll see in a few minutes, where King Tut's tomb is. Um, <clears throat> why is part of the building painted? Just one little section. He said, well, the contractor took the, all the money we paid him and, and absconded, <laughs> took off, and they never were able to get someone else, at least in the next two years or so since then. Noon prayer is a very powerful moment in any Islamic uh, majority country, city, whatever uh, culture. And in Cairo, of course, it's almost entirely, it's 10% Christian, actually. Yeah, 10% Coptic Christian, which is some of the, one of the oldest Christian denominations. It's, it even predates uh, Catholicism. Uh, but the other 90% are, are almost all Muslim. And uh, what you know, some of you, five times a day, you're supposed to stop and pray, no matter where you are, what you're doing, unless you're like, you know, in an operating room at a hospital or driving a bus or something where it's dangerous. But if you're able safely to stop whatever you're doing in an office, a school, in the streets, that's what these people had just, noon prayer had just ended. This guy was standing here in the middle of the street saying his prayers and then the, the imam stopped the prayer, you know, that you can hear their voices all over Cairo and any other large or even smaller. Oh, okay. Let's see. Um, Trying to get these people in. Yeah, here we go. There we go. I hope that's it. All right. Do you guys get, just came in? Did we get those people in? I can't tell. It's just too many distractions here. Yeah. Okay. Elijah, good. You're here. And uh, Althea, all right. Uh, I don't see anybody else listed on the screen as in the waiting room. My apologies if you just joined us because of the the glitches that occurred that I don't want to waste time repeating what happened, but I don't think it'll happen again. In any case, I'll just start much earlier trying to set up the class than, than the usual 15 minutes just to troubleshoot. I don't think you'll have to wait that long again, so my apologies again. All right, here we are in the streets of Cairo, and we're seeing noon prayer when the imams decide, as they do, for instance, at this mosque here, interesting, a seven up <laughs> ad, and a Christian church side by side. This is proof of what I saw when I was there, but I know it's changed some. Christians and Muslims have been living side, and side, uh, side by side in uh, Egypt for over 1,500 years. Uh, after all, Egypt was part of the Byzantine Empire, and uh, that's something we're going to talk about in this class. It's on the syllabus, in fact, which followed the Roman Empire, was the successor to the Roman Empire for hundreds of years, well, a couple hundred years. And then um, it, it, Islamic invaders, of course, uh, converted the population to uh, Islam, most of it. But they there were still 10% that didn't convert, and that's still what you have in a country of 100 million people. Uh, Egypt has slightly over 100 million. There's about 10 million. Christians. And you see those two houses of worship side by side. When this was a fun thing here, this is Mustafa Kemal. He was one of the heroes who tried to get the British out early in the 20th century. I think it was in the 20s, even or early 30s. And it didn't succeed. But because he was so popular, the, the Brits didn't execute him, which, you know, would have happened in a lot of colonial outposts uh, for anyone who tried to rebel against their masters you know so he's a hero in more ways than one and that's a statue of him and look what he's pointing at donald duck for a saturday matinee <clears throat> the 15 percent of cairo that is middle class at least it was when i was there i don't know what the percentage is now but it probably not much higher if, if at all uh could send their kids to a saturday matinee but when i walked by this theater i almost had to put earplugs in because besides booming 
out onto the street and loudspeakers the um, soundtrack of a well, uh, you know, Donald Duck cartoon. You know how Donald Duck's voice is. It's already enough, you know, hard on yours. And then dubbing that in Arabic, that was excruciating. It was one of the louder soundtracks I'd heard anywhere in all my travels. And this is the Nile, and it is literally more than a mile wide. Uh, at the, every, I traveled down the Nile, both coming up and down. Up means down. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Rivers flow to the sea, so up river means south. If it's a north-south river, as the Nile, of course, runs north-south into the Mediterranean. So when you go up river, it's, it's to the south. So we did that, but first we'll see the rest, of, a little more of Cairo. Those fishing boats are fantastically, beautifully done with you know, different colors and decorative detailing and hand-carved wooden prows. Uh, families pass them on, father to son to grandson, uh, generation after generation. And then this is another example. Here's a British br a bridge built by the Brits when they were colonial masters in Egypt, probably in the early 1900s with the British lions, right? And then here's a building that was going to be a high rise condominium complex or development. And again, somebody absconded with the funds. Well, when I uh, had some students from uh, in the late 90s, one of my first classes from the uh, JC here, uh, show to us their slides for extra credit of their trip, a husband and wife, that building was still there with the cranes exactly frozen in the same position more than 20 or almost 20 years later. Now, this is an example of learning uh, the uh, different ways of different cultures and being aware of that and sensitive. That's what I was looking for. I made a mistake that I am lucky I didn't end up paying for much more, even though it was totally innocent because I didn't think about what I was doing. This is a, Tur a Turkish sentry box from a, about the 1500s when Turkey ruled the whole Middle East. They had a huge empire. We'll briefly talk about them too uh, later this semester. And here's an Egyptian soldier, uh, obviously armed with an M16. I believe the US military sold them, their military. So he was on guard in front of a, a military uh, headquarters and I wasn't even thinking about it. I didn't see him, he was in the shadows. I just wanted this beautiful piece of folk art, the 500 year old handmade wooden sentry box on the streets of Cairo. Well, as soon as my camera shutter clicked, yes, this is in the old days, 35 millimeter film camera. He stepped out from the shadows, grabbed my camera and started yelling at me in Arabic. And I didn't know exactly what, but I could tell it wasn't good. He was probably gonna take me in to be interrogated as a spy or something, I, it could have been in big trouble. Uh, so luckily for me, a professor who spoke both fluent English and of course Arabic was walking by. He happened to have his briefcase in his hand and he stopped and he said, what's going on here to me? Uh, it was obvious I was a foreigner. And I told him and this guy talked the guard down from uh, you know, what he was about to do, which is, you know, and he even get, obviously gave me my camera back because here's the, but what does that prove to me? This is an important lesson for everyone who's in a foreign cu culture. As long as you're traveling, I hope all of you do it. So, or those of you want to travel to another country, we'll try to do it on the street level and not just in a bubble, you know, like a tourist bus where you don't really meet the people from the culture. So you're not really getting any sense of what their lives are like. I, I only travel that way when there's no other choice. The first time I went to Russia, that was the only way you could go. And even then I broke away from the tour bus and went into a park and talked to some of the locals. But in general, if you're on the streets of a, of a foreign city or any for, in any foreign country and, and a culture that you don't already understand, it is the reverse of that old saying, it's better to ask for forgiveness and permission. No, uh -uh. no, just the opposite is the case when you're in a foreign culture. You should always ask for permission uh, first and then you won't get in trouble. So that's lesson learned. I didn't, I didn't make that mistake again and I'll show you the evidence of that. We're, we're gonna leave Cairo to go to the Great Pyramid in just a couple minutes. This is one of the oldest mosques in Cairo. I love this. And here's one of the uh, Imams heading in to uh, say the, the prayers and look at that minaret. Isn't that beautiful? It's about five, 600 year old mosque. And, of course, the, the prayer tower is the minaret. We'll talk about Islamic architecture and uh, our architectural history uh, when we get to that unit in a couple of weeks. Now, this is where I had learned my lesson. Here is the Imam. I saw him. He was about to start that prayer. It wasn't noon by this time. It was the afternoon prayer, I guess. So I went up to him and luckily he spoke enough English. He understood me. I said, I don't want to intrude or anything, but such a beautiful building. This mosque was 
five, no, 600 years old, he told me, 1400s. I said, is there any way it's okay, or is if it's not, I won't, to take a picture of the interior? He said, yes, as long as you wait till no one's face is showing directly. So I waited until everyone was facing the front of the mosque, of course, for their prayers, to make sure that their faces weren't shown. And then it was okay. Again, asking permission, not forgiveness. Okay, let's go now to the Great Pyramids. Going out of town, you see a lot of these old British era Art Deco style tea shops. They love tea and coffee. It's all good there. And now we'll get to the Great Pyramid after passing by. There's that, that mosque. There we have the Pyramid of Cheops. We talked about it last week, so I don't need to get you. are not take, having to take notes now. You should already have those. Look at the encampment of camel uh, drivers, I'm going to say camel jockeys, that of course cater to the tourists, uh, which is how many of them make most of their income, or at least a large part of their, their living. That's a 460 foot tall, well, the right phrase is man-made mountain. So let's go up close to it and I'll tell you what, what happened when I went inside, something bizarre, to see the great burial chamber. I hear these guys asking if I, I, I don't like camels. <laughs> I rode one once in Jordan. They're, they're mean, they bite, they smell, they kick, they can buck you off their back as much, almost as, as easily as a horse can if it doesn't like you. So I just avoided the camels and said, thank you, no thank you. But this is how you get into uh, the entrance here. You see this guy here, he's trying to find a way to get into the center. As it turns out, that's a false entrance. The real one was disguised, it's down here. So let's see what happens when you get close and you look up. I thought I'd try to climb to the top. No way. It was 115 degrees. There was no shade. Uh, it just wasn't a wise thing. It probably would have, you know, at least got heat stroke, if not something worse. So instead, I decided to go inside with my two teacher friends into the great burial chamber. So you have to take this path here. And it's a very, very narrow, low ceiling narrow space with minimal lighting. In fact, there were only 40 watt light bulbs and half of them were burned out. So you'd go for a long stretch in total darkness on your hands and knees because the, the top wasn't more than four feet. And I, there's no way you could crouch that long. It took about 10 minutes to, or even more to get to the great barrel chamber. But we didn't get there the first time because I was following a German couple and I speak a little German, ich spreche ein Deutsch. And I remember thinking, uh oh, this could be a problem. But I thought, oh, well, maybe th th this won't happen. She was saying how she didn't, the wife was telling her husband as she's crawling into this <laughs> narrow little sp confined space, I'm not sure if we should do this. I, I don't like these small. Uh, spaces and I thought uh oh here we go we got halfway halfway in there like five six seven minutes into this tunnel and suddenly she starts screaming screaming at the top of her lungs help get me out in German and English and she started backing up you know crawling backwards so everyone behind her me and my two other friends that came from from uh, the Bay Area we all had everybody there was about two or three dozen of us had to crawl backwards all the way back out of the tunnel and when they got to the entrance again when they the couple came there there was an ambulance waiting for the uh, the wife and they took her and of course probably some kind of a minor reaction but you know she could have had some kind of a serious medical condition like a stroke. Yeah, so if you don't like confined spaces, don't go inside the Great Pyramid. It's not a good uh, idea if, if, if you're claustrophobic. You can see some past uh, not so conscientious visitors have chiseled away at the stone thinking that would help them with their attempts to climb, but luckily that stops at about the 10th row of stones and the rest I didn't see that on the upper levels. Okay, so now we're going to go see the Valley of the Kings and we'll just uh, see a little bit of King Tut's interior of his tomb. You could take these boats. Well, you have to actually to get across. There's no bridge there. Uh, Luxor is a city of about 100,000, not a small town, but nothing like Cairo. And of course, the main tourism, uh, I mean, industry is tourism. And of course, they um, have guided tours. And I recommend if you ever go there to have a guided tour with an English speaking tour guide from Egypt, which is what we did. We found him in the hotel where we were staying, which was a uh, family owned business. So they, they knew who was a good guide. And so we all got on this boat, me and my two friends and that guide. He, and he, you know, led us into the Valley of the Kings. That's what you're looking at. These are all former uh, Pharaoh's tombs that were cut into the rock, you see, but they were all empty, right? 
They were empty uh, until we got to 1922, exactly 100 years ago this year, and King Tut's tomb was found. So now we're going to go see what that looks like. You can see that if you don't get there before, why well, we started four in the morning, because when the sun rises at around five or 530, this was in August. Not the best month to go to Egypt, but was, you know, the time I was teaching summer school, that was the only break I had uh, when I was still a high school teacher at Skyline High. So we decided to get up at 4 a.m. and we beat the worst of the heat, but already by 6 a.m. It is, it's, it's really over 100 degrees. So you definitely need to take plenty of sunscreen, water, and big hats. Here's the entrance to King Tut's tomb. This is what it looked like when Lord Carter and his 100 international uh, expedition uh assistance you know colleagues he, he considered them colleagues i mean he, he didn't lord it over them in fact i think i've said this but if i didn't you should know he's a hero in egypt lord carter british explorer who found king Tut's tomb because he insisted everything that he found inside be kept in egypt which is why it's still there at the cairo museum so what he had to do was figure out with the help of his egyptian you know uh colleagues and i think uh, some other national you know people from like a dozen countries were on that expedition what do we do to open it if we use dynamite we can get in more quickly because to chip away at solid stone can take a year but if you use too much dynamite you'll destroy the in, the uh, interior and in, in all of the objects so he picked somehow exactly the right amount just enough to open up the entrance and here's how it looks inside that's uh, tut and his wife they were on the back of the throne we saw, remember, with the, uh, one of the last must know slides uh, from our last class. And it's what's on the syllabus, remember. And they did anoint each other with oil, and you'll see evidence of that in another closer view. And here's his sarcophagus. This is Tut's sarcophagus. Massive, must weigh a couple of tons, solid granite carved with uh, Anubis, right? The jackal headed god of the underworld that the Egyptians believe greeted you when you went to, you know, across the river Styx, and because S-T-Y-X is, you have to know these, these terms, but there's a god that greeted you and let you know if you were worthy of the good place, vaguely similar to the concepts of heaven and hell that some religious today have, but they were very specific functions for each of their gods, and you'll see images of them in any tomb, the Egyptian tomb. There we go. Um, <clears throat> See, this is him, Tut, and his wife, and he and she are giving each other, and you know, like, what's the word? And anointing each other with oil, I guess that's a phrase. They really did love each other, quite, quite clearly. And these are some of the servants that uh, there's a myth that they killed the servants and forced them, you know, to, to, to be buried in, or even buried them alive. I mean, that's Hollywood, right? Uh, along with the Pharaoh or anyone in the Pharaoh's family who had their own tombs uh, when the tombs were finally sealed up. But that's, some of the servants did ask to have that, uh, not, not, you know, be killed, but if when they died, if they died before the Pharaoh or whoever's tomb it was, they might want to be interred with them because then they got to go to the good place if that Pharaoh did and have, you know, uh, eternal employment <laughs> in the next life. But that's not, they didn't kill them, uh, you know, just to bury them with them, or, nor the, the Pharaoh's wives have to, to go with them, their deceased husbands. Because I already think I, we, yeah, we covered this. What happened with Tut's wife is she was forced to marry the man who succeeded him, who coveted both Tut's throne and, and was able to take that position and become the next pharaoh and his wife and forced her to marry him this is on the ceiling above the sarcophagus and uh, you can see here there's you know crocodile gods right and hippopotamus gods and then the signs of taurus right and leo uh and then there's anubis the uh again the one of the gods of the underworld it's beautiful colors the egyptians love gold and blue uh and you, you saw that on the headdress now these are other tombs here was one of the more fertile queens. We'll, we'll just do about uh, half a dozen more. And in case you're wondering why she was fertile, well, I'm not going to comment, but <laughs> apparently they were this, that Pharaoh, I don't remember the name, wasn't one of the more famous ones, was uh, uh, able to have large number of children. And he was proud of that. So that's what you saw illustrated on the wall of one of the walls of his tomb. And this is a, uh, a different Pharaoh who's praying to one of the gods, a statue of one of the gods. And then this is back to uh, 
pretty sure this is a now this is a different tomb, not Tuts. But these are two of the uh, creatures or you know mythical creatures that the Pharaoh supposedly could change himself into. One is uh, uh, just a vulture, uh, just a straight on vulture, like you know, you see occasionally on Earth. And then this is uh, the sun god Ra, with uh, snake heads coming out of the the disc, a winged disc, uh, which we will um, no, that's we already covered with Nefertiti. Yeah, now. This is what we'll finish with this. This is how the actual uh, temple slash tomb of Hatshepsut, we covered it again and was on the syllabus. And here now you can see how they've restored the upper level. They were still working on it when I took this slide, the third level, which didn't show in the slide that uh, Stockstead's files had. And there she is. She was one of the taller pharaohs. She was a good six foot, some say two, three even. I mean, that was uh, taller than most men ever were able to you know become uh back in the ancient world you know the height of almost all ethnic groups average adult height has increased over the last few centuries even more so but over the millennium quite a bit millennial plural so she's got statues uh to her because she was uh, very well liked by the population she actually cared about the fate of the the average uh, citizen and the workers and, and anyone who worked on like her temple here or other uh, monuments uh, would be paid better than maybe other workers and you know given more holidays and uh, better food and here she is as a pharaoh with the pharaoh's headdress disguised as a falcon and we know that uh, that's one of the the, the animal uh guises you could say that a pharaoh it was believed in their religion could turn themselves into and then this is her she had a kind of a slight distortion uh, genetic condition that caused but it, this is an exaggerated version of that with uh, a headdress and then then she also had a protector god and that's called the cow god in english and that's what those are so let's finish up with a view of what happens when you are long, along the nile this is a temple where the columns on the left that's alexander the great built that temple and if this helps, I hope it does for some of you to get a concept clear as to placing the, how far back in human history ancient Egypt was at its golden age, how far back that goes. When Alexander the Great came to Egypt and saw the Great Pyramids, I told you he went inside one, thought he saw his own death, right? Um, those structures, the three Great Pyramids, were already 2,300 years old. So they were as old to him as his time is to us he lived 300 years before three centuries before the common era 2300 years ago in other words the great pyramids are twice as far back in human history as uh, early ancient greek history so okay so let's do uh we'll do a new share well let's see how this goes here because i have to stop the share i think i have to go off the screen so I'll, if anybody joined late if you have questions uh, i think i already said this but i think we got a few people which is no one's fault but definitely didn't uh anticipate that i'd be blocked from entering um my own zoom account until i came up with a new password which is what happened so it shouldn't happen again uh any questions anybody has now let's do this i'm going to go to Screen share. Yeah. Okay, <clears throat> I'm going to go to what we're looking at now, which is uh, going to be the main topic for today and on Wednesday. This this week's main topic, which is uh, uh, Aegean art. Here we go. Do anybody have any questions about it? the papers? Are due a week from Wednesday, nine days from now. But but you have until midnight, and you can send me examples of uh, what it is you've written if you want me to give you feedback. But uh, like I've said many times, please don't wait till the day before it's due. You won't get, get a response in time. But if you give me at least 48 hours, I can do that. Okay, we're gonna go to a GNR. So here we go. Yeah, oops, I overshot it slightly. Yeah, there we go. <clears throat> Let's see, because on this syllabus, I cut down on the number of slides. Um, well, actually, that's the first must know. Here it is. Okay, uh, but I haven't done the share. Hang on. Yeah, I have to go back down to where we do. Let's get rid of this screen share. Now, can people see this? Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> Good, yep. thank you. Yes. There we go. Well, we're doing well on time, so 
Uh, in fact, when we uh, get to on Wednesday, I should be able to show you the actual site of Atlantis, the lost continent. I hope that piques your curiosity. There are people who believe that one of the main Greek islands, one of the most beautiful islands I've ever been to, uh, it was three perfect days on Santorini. You may have heard of that island. Uh, it's been in a number of movies because it's so beautiful. Um, many people think that's where the site or the inspiration, I should say, for the site of uh, the lost continent of Atlantis. And there's a reason why historically and uh, geographically, it makes sense. I'll explain that if time permits at the end of the next lecture on Wednesday, I'll show you just, you know, probably only 10 minutes or 15 at most of my own slides uh, at the end of the must knows. But right now we're on the syllabus. You, you see week five, this is the first must know slide, okay? Female figure, two words, just like it sounds, female figure. The location is, is a group of islands, Greek islands, Cyclades, that's spelled C-Y-C-L-A-D-E-S, Cyclades, 2500, 2500 BC or BCE. Okay, so this is a, uh, it almost looks like a, um, you know, modern, oh, abstract, some would even say abstract sculpture uh, of a, a vaguely female figure and that's why i find it fascinating in any case it's it's unusual in that this culture is a prehistoric culture we don't have any records from that far back but because it it's it's the root or this is the site of it the, these islands these are in the eastern uh, mediterranean which is the aegean sea and then this is a part of the aegean sea that's even further east it's basically off the coast of turkey if you follow me there. So these are the easternmost Greek islands. That's a short way to write it. The Cyclades, they're called, they're still called that. They had a very early culture around the time the ancient Egyptians were, of course, uh, building their great temples and cities. Uh, this is about the same age as the Great Pyramids. So they didn't build any great monuments, but they had a very distinctive style for their sculpture. So we know this is a female because of the, the breasts and uh, in general, the overall, you know, presentation gives us a hint that it's a female probably well yes would be an adult female standing upright with her arms crossed and there are no facial features except the nose so we could get some sense that this if this is a female figure of some important person in their culture perhaps again a high priestess that's a likely there's no we don't have written records so we don't know we're just it's an educated guess that many historians i would include myself believe this is some kind of a high priestess a figure that might have been not maybe a portrait in this case like that face of a woman from uruk we saw a couple of weeks ago uh, but maybe just a general or generic, you can use either word, general or generic with a G, you know, G-E-N-E-R-I-C means general, uh, image of a, a high priestess that could be used uh, for some kind of ceremony, religious ceremony in a temple. Uh, and so we don't know that, but that's a likely guess. What we do know is it's about two feet tall. Uh, this is my own photo I took. It's at the Louvre in, in Paris. And there are hundreds of these in just the Louvre itself has hundreds, but thousands of them have been found by archaeologists buried uh, in the ruins of some of their uh, smaller towns. They didn't have any big cities, you know, great big cities like the Egyptians did or later the Babylonians and the, the Greeks and Romans, but they, they had towns and they, they were farmers. Um, so they had an urban, you know, early version of urban civilization. And their artists produce these wonderful uh, images, male and female, but the females are the ones that people think are more likely to be a specific purpose, such as some kind of an icon, right? Maybe an amulet, but usually amulets, remember, are smaller and you can hold them in your hand and they're more obviously, the purpose for them is usually more clear from the design. So it's probably not an amulet, it's probably some kind of a religious icon symbol for whatever their religious beliefs and ceremonial worship services were. Perhaps it was used during one of their religious ceremonies, you know, not only once, but, you know, a certain type of religious ceremony, or even maybe as a decoration in one of their temples. It's pretty much the whole meaning. There isn't much more we can say about this as we don't know more than that. Okay, so let's do a formal analysis. It's balanced. Oh, yeah. 
no question it's balanced left to right and i would say if you draw the line here right underneath the arms around the top of the belly you'd say you could say it's balanced uh, top to bottom in general the way actual intact human bodies would be the rhythm here is is minimal but there is rhythm the two legs the two arms the two breasts there is carved line here mostly in the genital area of course that's obviously uh small minimal very very faint but it's there it's carved and then this you, you call that carved line where the two arms are folded over each other but that's about it I, this is not really carved line well it's it's a piece of stone carved down or carved away to leave just the piece of the where the nose would be right on a human face so you could say that's carved line if you look at it that way uh, so there is only carved line, no painted line, of course, or drawn line. Uh, then we have, is it stable? I would say mostly, because the arms are at a right angle. It's uh, a human adult figure standing upright. The head and neck are pretty much completely stable. And even the legs. So even though the top of the head is slightly curved, look, it's not really rounded the way a regular normal human uh, top of the human head would be. <clears throat> so it's mostly uh, stable with some little bit of dynamic detail. Uh, and then we have the color is a cool gray color. The texture, there's no cement texture. It's a rough, real texture of stone. And of course you can guess, but if it's not obvious, you should write that uh, the modeling is just the lighting, uh, shadows, I'm sorry, I meant to say, shadows created by the lighting from the museum. And uh, I think I mentioned the rhythm already. Um, all right. I don't think. Oh, for space, it's it's a real object, two dimensional object that's about two feet high, and you could say the arms overlap and the uh, the body. Okay. But now we get to one that is important enough that I can guarantee I won't cut it from the study list. I always try to give you guys a heads up when those kind of slides are on the screen, and this is one of those. So next must know uh, for our list from week five. Palace complex at Knossos. Palace, right? P-A-L-A-C-E, complex at, and then Knossos is the, the city that it's in. And I'll spell that as K-N-O-S-S-O-S. -S -S -S. And the location is a Greek island called Crete. I think you know, but I'll spell that too. C-R-E-T-E. -E. It's the largest Greek island. The date is 1700 B.C. or B.C.E. Okay, now we're getting to a culture that I greatly admire and that most people know very little about unless you've traveled to these Greek <laughs> islands. Sorry, I have to elevate my foot down below. <laughs> Every so often it's still a problem to tell there. All right, so, so who were these people? They were the Minoans, M-I-N-O-A-N. That's you know the name of the the, the culture that created the, the sites we're going to see for the next several slides. That was the Minoan culture, M I N O A N, and that is what an early Greek island culture. But they weren't Greeks. Don't don't make that uh, you know mistake of thinking oh they're just the earliest form of Greek civilization. No, they were a very distinct civilization. The Greeks admired them, studied them, were inspired and influenced by them a thousand or so years later when the Greek city-state started, which is a good thousand years later. So these people were kind of, you could say, ethnically related to the uh, ancient Greeks, the classical, they call it Greek, uh, you know, uh, culture that we'll be studying next week, in fact. Uh, but they weren't the same culture. They had different religion, different language, and different traditions, and very different architecture. So what are we looking at? We're looking at the entrance to the palace of the king and queen of the Minoan kingdom. They were not an empire. That's a, one of many things that marks them as very, very different than any of the other ancient cultures we're studying in this class. I'll say that again. They did not conquer or invade any of their neighbors. That right there is a very unusual quality for a uh, very advanced culture. They could have but they didn't have a standing army. They had bodyguards, you know, security for their cities, of course, that's always been the case, uh, pretty much, you know, through human history, when you get to an urban center, you have to have some kind of security. So they had that, but they did not have a standing army. 
They had a navy because they kind of had to to defend themselves, but they were never attacked even. And they never did attack or invade any of the neighboring kingdoms. So that's the first of three things that mark them as completely different when you put all these two things together, the Minoans, than any of the other ancient cultures that we are studying. Okay, a second thing is that they did not abuse animals. It was against their religion. Uh, they had animals in their ceremonies. You'll see the evidence in the next couple of slides, but they didn't harm them. They did not uh, sacrifice animals, nor did they uh, harm them uh, and or draw their blood. In their religious ceremonies, animals were treated uh, respectfully, you can say, or, or you know, without uh, any harm. Very unusual. <laughs> You could say they were animal lovers, but that's too much of a modern concept. Uh, again, in the ancient world, we saw the evidence that that's not typical with the Babylonian and Assyrian hunting panels, right? But the third thing, maybe the most remarkable, that men and women had uh, of the in the ruling classes, you have to say it that way, among the ruling classes, men and women had equal importance and equal power in both the religious and political uh, life of this kingdom. Again, men and women had equal importance and power. They shared equally. Both the political and religious ceremonial functions were, were equally, uh, you know, administered, or if you want to say it that way, by, by women. There was a king and a queen who weren't necessarily a couple. Maybe they were sometimes, sometimes they weren't even related, but they ruled jointly. You'll see the proof of that in the next few slides. So this was the entrance to the king and queen's palace in which each one of those monarchs, one separate room, throne room for the king and a different throne room for the queen. And they each had their own important functions and were equally important. Very, very rare in the ancient world, right? As we know, there were only three female pharaohs who had any real power out of the thousand years in ancient Egyptian history. And then finally, they, they worship certain animals. Uh, they worship snakes, bulls, and dolphins. Those were their three most sacred animals. And so these are bull horns, symbolic of their worship of bulls. And supposedly, some of you know that the legend of the Minotaur, right? Half bull, half human, that lived in uh, supposedly a, a maze, right? Below the royal palace. That's just one of their religious, obviously, that wasn't such a creature. Uh, but that's one of those stories the Greeks liked enough to incorporate into their own religious uh, folk tales. Uh, but that started with this culture, even though they did not experiment on mating bulls and eels or anything like that. Because, you know, uh, okay, that was just one of their many religious myths or folk tales. All right, so here are the stairs leading to the plaza in front of the main entrance. That's the opening to the palace complex. We're going to go see the interior of the complex in the next few slides. And then here's public art, right? <laughs> I mean, like we see today in public places uh, that was meant to, you know, um, symbolize their worship of bulls. Okay, so let's now uh, talk about the, uh, or do the formal elements. For space, this is a 15 foot high ceiling with a long, narrow entry hallway. That's about all you can say, or entry hall. You don't even have to say hallway. So it's a long, narrow entry hall with a 15 foot high ceiling. There is no technique, of course, when it's a building, it's a real space. Okay, then of course that does have strong modeling because of the shadows from the sun created by the, the roof here. So underneath the roof, you see strong modeling, but there's no technique for modeling. Line here is visual line, except for the top of the two columns, one square and one round. There, that's painted black on white, painted over wood. The columns would have been wood. And then the tops, they're called the capitals of the columns, did have painted line in some of those temples. Or in this case, it's the public building, of course. But other than that minor bit of painted line, all the rest of the line here is um, visual around the corners, right? especially more noticeable here, wherever shadows form a visual line. You could even say there on the sculpture of the bullhorns too. The rhythm should be obvious with the stones and the walls, the columns, even though they're not exactly the same shape, they're the same height and width, the two bullhorns, and then the stairs. These are the stairs that, that the public would take, you know, citizens would take if they wanted to come visit or a visitor from another country. If they wanted to come have a, um, 
you know, an audience with the king. They would take those stairs to get to the, and then get permission, you know, at the entrance from one of the security people to get in to see the king or queen. Okay. Now, the other things are texture. The texture is a real smooth texture of painted wood on the two columns, right? And then it's the real rough texture of bricks and stone on the walls of the entry hall and real rough texture of stone on the steps. But you would have to say there's a fourth texture and that's smooth. It, it, now that's concrete, because that's a modern thing the Greek government made this. But they know that's what they had here because they found actual plans and, and frescoes showing this temple complex with the, the way it looked when it was new. So they recreated it from concrete, but the actual stone would have been polished smooth on the bullhorns. Uh, so that would have been a, um, simulated texture if you want to look at that one but now it's the real smooth texture of concrete that's how i would write it let's see uh, balance yeah if you stood right here the bullhorns are literally in the middle of the plaza it's you know goes from here to over here uh and it's dead center and then there's you know obviously a balance in the entry hall if you divide it down the middle or side to side you've got top to bottom left to right it's balanced both ways it is mostly stable the only things dynamic are the you know, interior the part of the bullhorns is that the bottom, I guess, mostly, and then the, the tops of the columns. Uh, even, even here, this is still mostly stable. So the round column is, of course, dynamic, but everything else is at right angle, so it's mostly stable. The colors are cool on the stairs and the uh, bullhorn sculpture and the two painted columns warm on the rest of the entry hall with the reds and, and orange colored uh, brick and stone. Okay. Now you can rest your hands, or say your pens, but that, and and you you'll we'll see this. Let's get a little larger image of it. This was the audience. Uh, I guess it's not a hall, but behind it would have been a hallway. So you could say that where the king or somebody who was authorized to speak for the king could make announcements to crowds down below, in the plaza, looking up they would make major announcements about various, you know, events or celebrations or, uh, you know, new rules or laws or what have you. Uh, the king or someone representing the king or queen, could be either or both, would come out on this uh, balcony here. And this is, of course, a portico, column porch. We'll get to that word next week. So you'll have to write that down. All right. But let's go inside the complex. You want to take notes for about the next three or four slides. These are my own slides. From, it's fascinating this place. Knossos is on the island of Crete. As I say, it's the biggest Greek island in the Aegean. And it is the main island that the Minoans occupied, but they occupied all of what's now almost all the other islands that we call the Greek islands, which are all part of the modern country of Greece now, of course. And so there's many ruined sites from, uh, you know, the earliest prehistoric Cycladic figures like we first saw the first slide today, uh, all the way through Minoans and, uh, of course, on past the Romans, a very rich archaeological terrain, <laughs> the Greek islands, multiple millennia, uh, millennia, is that the right word, millenniums, um, multiple, you know, cultures overlapping hundreds of years and some of them a thousand years each, and then they fell in the next one, of course, occupied the same area. So it's really rich territory for archaeologists. So this is the walkway leading into one of the throne rooms. We're going to see both of them, the king and queens. These are Minoan columns. I just love the way these, it's, it's very different. They're not at all like Greek and Roman columns, except that they're round <laughs> and tall. Uh, they flare upwards. <laughs> you see that? They're narrower at the bottom. They get wider at the top. And then they have this black and gold paint and barn, New England, almost barn red color on the, the, the shaft of the, of the columns. Uh, but now we'll go see the king's throne room. This has been restored, but they found it pretty much, you know, like this. The ceiling has been completely reconstructed, I'm sure, but the upper walls. But the throne itself, the floor, and uh, the, the, the painting on here, these are griffins. Some of you know right there, mythological creatures that are <clears throat> half bird and half lion or the lion with the head of a bird. And they would often be shown as guarding the throne of a king or queen in ancient cultures. They weren't only the Minoans, the Griffins were known all over the ancient Middle East. 
And then these are bulrushes. Well, that's what I call them. The, the, you see them along the bay here. It's the same climate. We have Mediterranean climate there in the Greek islands. And these grow in the marshlands um, around the bay. If you've ever done any <laughs> exploring or hiking along the edges of the waters, especially around Marin County, <clears throat> you can see these growing up in the marshlands. So uh, it was a, a, literally a Mediterranean climate and a Mediterranean culture. Okay, and then this is a different view that I uh, found recently. Look how small and how narrow that throne was. This is the king's throne. And, and then there's one of the griffins, beautifully done and very inspirational for Art Deco style de uh, interior design or furniture or clothing, you know, even fashion <coughs> and decorative objects. <coughs> Um, this this was one of the cultures that inspired that movement of the 1920s, where the first inspiration was King Tut's tomb. That's how Art Deco got started. If you don't know what that is, you don't have to know for this class. If you take Art 2.2 or 1.2, we might go into that. But in any case, it's 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 a movement that was inspired by some of the ancient mot motifs, I should say, and styles of an the ancient world uh, from mostly Mediterranean cultures like Egypt, Babylon, Greece, and Minoan. Okay, and then we have, this is on the wall of the queen's throne room. You see how they portray the dolphins as having clearly, I would say both intelligence, right? That they have, you know, they are highly intelligent animals, but also like they have a soul. And that's pretty much how they viewed animals. And again, you know, how different that was than the, almost every other ancient uh, culture in the Mediterranean. And there's the queen's throne room and there's your throne. And this louvered ceiling is a brilliant technique to get the air flowing through. It gets very hot in the summer there, well over 100, 110 degrees, not quite as bad as Egypt, but almost. And there, was, there were no trees around. Uh, this is outside the, the capital city of uh, Crete. Um, and you have to walk up a dirt road, or I guess you could wait for a bus, which is not air conditioned anyway and crowded. So me and my... Uh, girlfriend we just walked up this 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 road about five miles with no shade and we were pretty hot and sweaty when we got there but we cooled off inside this room it was a good 20 degrees cooler than the air outside uh the queen's throne room <clears throat> because of the way they've opened up these passageways these air you know openings for the air to circulate is what i mean and the louvered ceiling has some kind of i don't understand the exact physics of it an effect on circulating air more um consistently or rapidly, I'm not sure which, to make the, the space in here cooler, noticeably cooler. And uh, so that was the Queen's throne room. Here's another view of it. it. Looks like they moved the throne at least once. And then here are the dolphins, which as they say, were one of the three animals that they thought were sacred and that they worshiped and that they had, but did not harm, they used in their religious ceremonies. So speaking of animals and religious ceremonies, let's do one more slide because we did get a late start. Uh, but this is an important one here. This is snake goddess, snake goddess, G-O-D-D-E-S-S. -S. That's Stocksnet's term. Most people uh, don't call her a goddess, but we'll call her a goddess. We don't know if this is a portrait of an actual person or a generic image of a high priestess, uh, or is it a goddess? <clears throat> there's, there's not enough written evidence to know for sure. So snake, she calls it goddess with two Ds, two Ss. Crete, I already spelled that, of course, same island, 1600 BC. So this is Minoan, and these uh, are the, uh, the, I should say the two snakes, I meant, are uh, among the three right, of their holiest or most sacred is the right word, sacred animals that they worshiped. I already mentioned the other two were the bull and uh, porpoises. So snakes were used in their religious ceremonies. So most, here's what I would say is the main fact about this. I won't cut this slide from the study list, by the way. It's an important enough one. It has a high possibility, again, of being on the midterm. So she's got two sacred animals, snakes, in her hands. And most historians believe that this is actually an image of a priestess, not a goddess, a human priestess conducting a religious ceremony in which the people in that temple would worship or say prayers to a snake goddess. That makes a lot more sense to me 
I, I just happen to disagree. I'm not by any means the only one with the assumption that not just Stuxnet, but some historians, including her, have made that this is a, a goddess as opposed to a human priestess, a high priestess. We know that high priestesses dress this way. They had leather aprons and yes, bare breasts. Okay, they had that's the leather apron, by the way, if it's not obvious which would protect against what? The snake bite, but the snakes are more likely to bite, bite someone you know, higher up, weren't they? And a leather um, headdress, right? Hand-tooled leather. And then what do you think that is? Anybody, what could that be on top? I think I know, on top of the uh, head of this snake, either priestess, a high priestess or snake goddess. Some kind of animal, obviously. Anybody want to hazard a guess? But a cat? Yeah, it looks like a very nervous cat that would rather be somewhere else. It's a very, I think it's meant to be slightly whimsical or or just an image of what they actually did. But I can't imagine you'd want a cat purchased on top of your head when two snakes are nearby because somebody's going to get scratched. Probably the human being below the headdress when the cat jumps off, you know, and clings to part of the body of the person that they were on top of. I, I see it as very risky to put it mildly but that would be part of why if it is a religious ceremony being conducted <clears throat> as this might be a, a portrait of a high priestess conducting a snake ceremony we know they had those ceremonies there's no debating that then it makes sense that she would have been look at her face in a trance like you almost have to be and they probably drank certain libations because they had alcoholic drinks back that far or some other type of substance to get in the right frame of mind and not worry about the fact that you've got a very nervous cat on top of your head and two poisonous snakes and yes they supposedly left from what i've read the poisonous fangs in the snake it in other words would get the attention of everyone in that room at that moment so of course that's the goal is that a high priestess if that's who this is would have wanted to you know literally almost get their um worshipers right or congregation if you prefer that word into a hypnotic trance-like state and then of course they're saying chants or prayers uh to their various gods including one of whom was a snake goddess and the other possibility is it's an image of a goddess but then there wouldn't be any particular risk of course for an immortal person to be bitten by a snake so i, I think it just makes more sense that it's an actual human being conducting a ceremony uh, to worship a snake goddess but we just don't know for sure and so formal analysis and we'll call it a day i'll stick around for any questions you may have you see here balance left to right as almost all human beings uh, bodies intact by design if you draw the line here i'd say you've got with the way the skirt widens out and her arms are here and you know her, her head you know and headdress but it's roughly balanced both left to right and top to bottom um and then we have it's mostly stable in terms of her pose or her stance and even her arms are mostly out at a right angle except you know obviously the forearms but um you know, obviously there's dynamic detail on the headdress, well, the cat, the breasts, the apron here, and actually the shape of the dress, the bell-like shape of her dress. Um, we have the rhythm of the arms, hands, breasts, the, the different parts of the dress, the pleats, I guess you'd call them, right? And there is painted and carved line. Carved line mostly on the face and the headdress, and a little bit on the jacket, the waist at least and painted line on most everything else, on the dress and the apron and uh, on her, uh, on the snake and, and, the, and the cat. The colors would have been, okay, a uh, white color because women were uh, depicted, whether they were high ranking or not, especially high ranking women, either noble women or, or high priestess in most of the ancient world up until the ancient Greeks, at least, uh, in the Mediterranean, uh, with white, color to distinguish them from males that's not about what their actual skin color was obviously it wouldn't have been that color um but it would distinguish this uh person as a female as if that wasn't already obvious of course uh so most historians have concluded in fact that i've seen this this very piece there are hundreds of them but this is one of the most famous ones it's in every textbook about ancient greek and minoan art uh it, it shows that the skin tone would have been the real skin tone would have been what I'm pointing at here, right? 
and then it, she would have had this white pancake like makeup over her exposed body parts her arms breasts and face so it's a mixture of cool and warm um yeah obviously the white colors are the cool and everything else is pretty much warm well there's some blue in the dress uh, and let's see, what do we um, balance? Stable. Oh, is it a single mass? Well, if you want to break it down, you could say she's the largest mass. And then I guess it's the snakes. And then the, uh, the cat or the headdress would be third largest, depending on how you see that. Um, and I think that, oh, for space, it's a three dimensional object. Uh, she's about 18 inches high. And there's overlapping of the headdress and the dress over her body and her hands over the snakes. Okay. We, we got about as far as we, we needed to today, and I appreciate your patience. I want to thank you again for that and persistence. I hope it paid off because, you know, now you don't have to go back. Of course, you can. I, this is being recorded, so it will be on um, YouTube. I'm back to where I'm able to post them by Friday at by 8 p.m. or sooner each week, each week's lectures. Okay, any questions anybody has? You should be starting to work on your papers, so if you have questions in the meantime between classes, of course, or at any point at the end or beginning of any class, uh, feel free to ask or send me an email. I have a question. Sure. So I got three PDFs, well, one with the other email, but in none of them, maybe I'm missing one, in none of them, none of them I see the guidelines to the short. Uh, oh, okay, then here we go. Thank you, that's what I was saying at the beginning, but we kind of got off to a, a rocky start because of all the technical glitches from Zoom. So would you send me anybody else's supplies to that's missing any of the handouts and those, you know, first three, of course, should be that everyone should buy, uh, definitely have by now, right? As your syllabus, the list of terms to know, right? And the course grading policies, that was all in the first week. But then you have, right, you have the um, five requirements for short paper, the nine elements of composition. And yes. the, the final one was the uh, sample of, of an A paper. So you're missing just which, whatever you're missing, send me an email to Mark W at AOL because that's faster for me to get them back to you. It's much okay. more cumbersome to, so do that today and I'll be able to send them to you. Maybe, maybe today, but it'll probably be tomorrow because I have to turn around and teach another three hour class in just a little okay. bit. Um, I have tomorrow. my email open right now. I'll just... Yeah, I'll send it, send it to Mark W and you'll get that, whatever you say you need as an ind individual uh, PDF attachment, I'll forward that to you. Anybody um, for the, oh, sorry. Sure, go ahead. Um, for the uh, printed source, do we do like, okay, the first two sources that we get online and then the printed one, we do like print in like parentheses and then the printed source. Yeah, yeah. in other words, I, I don't expect people to go to libraries because they still haven't opened the campus libraries, have they, though some public libraries are. So because of that obvious restriction, uh, you're given a pass. I, I put it in the, in the handouts of the five requirements, but I'll just restate it again, which is that as long as it was originally a printed source, put that in parentheses, either printed or from an original printed source in the parentheses. Like, for instance, Encyclopedia Botanica starts out every edition. They make new editions every few years, right? Uh, of that encyclopedia are uh, starting out as printed sources. The same with almost all newspapers and magazines, even in this digital age, they usually have both editions, right? And usually the, the, you know, one of them is printed. So you can say originally a print or printed source in parentheses, and that'll qualify. So you won't have points off for not having an actual physical copy that you read. Now, if you can do that, that's great. If you can actually go to a library or find a source, a book or whatever, that's actual three, three, D, three dimensional printed source, that's fine. But if you can't just, just put in parentheses and say from a printed source, because you're probably gonna want to, let, well, you should list the um, internet connection you use to find that source, but then put that clearly in the listing on your bibliography of that source that originally was a print source. Okay, that meets the requirement. Okay, anybody, there was another person had a question? Somebody else? I thought there were two people at once there. Anybody still have a question about anything relating to, yeah, papers is always, because now we're nine days before they're due, a week from Wednesday, or anything else about extra credit or um, grades in general. Okay, one more time. Any last minute questions? All right, well, um, we'll see the rest of the, uh, um, a G and art slides, and then we'll take a trip to Atlantis briefly at the uh, last part of next uh, the class on Wednesday uh, with my own slides of uh, Santorini and the Greek islands. All right, see you guys uh, two days from now. See you on Wednesday. Okay, take care.
Bye. Bye. Thank you. Take You're care. welcome. Thanks again for you guys' patience. I appreciate your conscientiousness and perseverance. Okay, see you soon.